Since the fall of Colonel Gaddafi, Libya is no longer a secret state. Former Scottish police detective George Thompson has come to Libya to say his last farewell to a mass murderer. The flowers and cake are for a man convicted of blowing up a jumbo jet over Lockerbie in Scotland. Internationally notorious, the Lockerbie bomber does not welcome visitors. Hello there, my name is George Thompson. I've come from Scotland to see Bassett. But in the end, Thompson charms his way past the security gate. Thompson is about to film the first, last, and only TV interview Al Magrahi will ever give about his case. Abdel Basit Magrahi, who is in the final stages of terminal cancer, claims new evidence will prove him innocent at last. It's from an expert dealing with the criminal cases. It will be very good because it will, it will clear my name. He's very sick. Anybody who tries to say that he's not dying just needs to go in and see the man. I would say he's in his deathbed now. Uh, I was shocked when I saw him, quite upset. But uh, after a wee while he came round and he told me certain things, he showed me certain things, which he has given me permission to reveal. But whatever it is, it helps the truth. And I can reveal that they have some devastating evidence. The new evidence involves a tiny fragment of circuit board, part of the terrorist bomb's timing device. It links Al Megrahi in the state of Libya to the Lockerbie bombing. Now, new scientific tests prove this is false, and that British government scientists knew this all along. In the Lockerbie Town Cemetery, there is a memorial to the human cost of what happened on a winter's night in 1988. When Pan Am Flight 103 was brought down by a terrorist bomb, 270 innocent people, passengers, air crew, and people on the ground had their lives taken away from them. John Ashton has been investigating the Lockerbie case for almost 20 years. The Lockerbie disaster was Europe's worst terrorist attack. More American civilians died in that attack than in any other terrorist event before 9-11. It's also Britain's worst miscarriage of justice. The wrong man was convicted, and the real killers are still out there. Five years ago, the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission, which is based in Glasgow, produced a still unpublished report which found six grounds for saying there was a miscarriage of justice. The SCCRC's chief executive is Gerard Sinclair. Well, the SCCRC is a quasi-judicial public body which was set up uh, in Scotland in 1999 for the purposes of investigating allegations of miscarriage of justice. It's an independent body which is separate both from the government and from the courts. After working as an investigator for Al Magrahi's legal team, John Ashton went on to write his biography. Thanks to Al Magrahi, Ashton gained rare access to the report by the Scottish Criminal Case Review Commission. That report has never been made public. It contains the evidence that should have overturned his conviction. In Edinburgh, the chair of the Scottish Parliament's Justice Committee, Christine Graham, is pushing to get the report published. That is the report that said there could very well have been a miscarriage of justice with regard to Abdel Bassett al Megrahi. Now, that report has never seen the light of day. So perhaps if we could see that, not just my committee, 
but the public at large internationally, then we could begin to understand what really happened that night at Lockerbie. It's a very limited circulation, this document. Yes. Can I read it? Uh, simple answer is no, not at the moment. And in fact, it's a criminal offence under the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 for any member of the Commission to publish or release information contained within a document. The report was only ever given to a handful of people. One of them, Maggie Scott QC, was the advocate leading the defence team. Have you seen the SCCRC report? Yes. Could you show it to us? No. Could you explain why? I have no instructions in respect of um, releasing that report, so I'm not in a position to do so. Even Scotland's Minister of Justice is not allowed to read the report. Could you make a copy of the SCCRC report available to us? Uh, well, I can't make, I haven't seen the copy and I don't uh, have it. It's uh, with SCCRC. The SCCRC report found that Al Megrahi had strong grounds to appeal against his 27 year prison sentence. George Thompson was hired by Al Megrahi's legal team to investigate the case. For more than two years, he visited Al Megrahi in jail almost daily, and they became close. When I first met Bassett, he had just been given quite a, a big sentence, and he seems to have lost heart. But as we got into the actual evidence and we were able to show him that we could make some progress, his mood changed. After a very careful examination of the evidence which convicted him, there's massive holes in it. There's something far wrong with it. And I think had the appeal been allowed to go ahead, all that kind of evidence would have come out and I think he would have gone home anyway on appeal. McGrahy should never have been convicted and we now have the documents 20 years on from when he was first charged that show this to be the case. Had these documents been exposed at his trial, it's very, very likely that he would not have been convicted. With the help of these two professional investigators, this programme will examine the secret contents of the SCCRC report. It will also reveal the fresh scientific evidence which is unknown to the Commission, but which demolishes the case against the man known as the Lockerbie Bomber. December the 21st, 1988, the night of the winter solstice, the longest night in the year. At 6.30 p.m., Pan Am Flight 103 took off from London Heathrow. Next stop, JFK, New York. In the baggage hold was a brown Samsonite suitcase packed with new clothes and a Toshiba radio cassette player. Hidden in the Toshiba were some 450 grams of high explosive and a timer. At three minutes past seven, 31,000 feet over Scotland, the bomb exploded. 46 and a half seconds later, 200,000 pounds of kerosene ignited as the wings and part of the fuselage crashed onto Lockerbie. On the morning after the crash, human remains and plane wreckage lay scattered over 850 square miles. And every shard of metal, every scrap of flesh or bone was now a clue in a murder inquiry. For months, Scottish police conducted painstaking fingertip searches for evidence. The breakthrough came when they found fragments of clothing that had been in the suitcase with the bomb and a label that read, Made in Malta. Straddling the trade route between Italy and Libya, the Mediterranean island of Malta has, for 5,000 years, been a crossroad for rival civilizations. The Malta connection took police to this clothes factory. Its cut and order books showed that in November 1988, garments later recovered from the crash site had been supplied to a small clothes shop in a slightly run-down district called Slima.
We're now coming down into the Slima area where Gucci's shop is. The Lockerbie investigation has brought George Thompson to Malta many times. Just up here on the left hand side is the actual shop. In fact, it's closed. It's the one that says Mary's house. The shopkeeper, Tony Gauci, would become the most important single witness in the case. Almost nine months after the Lockerbie atrocity, on September the 1st, 1989, police visited Mary's house to take their first statement from Tony Gauci. It was around 6.30 p.m., just before closing time. The man's behavior was strange. That is why I can now remember. He asked for a design jacket, and when I asked him for his size, he just said, it's not for me. On picking out the trousers, I asked him what size, and he said, more or less my size. It was as if anything I suggested he buy, he would take it. I even showed him a black colored umbrella, and he bought it. He then walked out to the shop with the umbrella, which he opened as it was raining. The police then asked Gauci to describe the man who had bought the clothes. In the first statement, uh, he says, he described him as being six foot or more in height. Gauci went on to say he had a, a big chest and a large head. His hair was very black. He was speaking Libyan to me. He was speaking Libyan to me. He was from Libya. Filmed covertly in 2011, Tony Gauci is famously camera shy. Back in 1989, he went to a police station to help with a photo fit of the suspect. Gauci added new details to his description. He said the man was about 16 and a half or 17 inch collar and about 50 years of age. I think the easiest thing to do is to show you the result of the artist's impression. And that came out with that. It's meant to be Mr. McGrath yeah. And what are the differences? One simple difference. It looks nothing like him. The broad-shouldered, six-foot-tall, dark-skinned, 50-year-old man bears little resemblance to the five-foot-seven, light-skinned, 36-year-old Al McGrath. As we will see, Gauchi's identification of al Magrahi was highly controversial, but as far as the police were concerned, they now had their suspect. And it turned out that al Magrahi was no stranger to Malta. He'd been head of security at Libyan Arab Airlines, and he'd been a frequent visitor to the island. This hotel registration card shows that he was in Malta in December 1988, and the court concluded that the only day on which Al Magrahi could have bought the clothes from Tony Gauci's shop was December the 7th. John Ashton is in Lockerbie to follow up evidence that throws the crucial December the 7th date into question. Because the three Scottish judges who conducted the trial failed to take proper account of this evidence, the SCCRC concluded that the verdict of the trial was unreasonable. Ashton needs a map of the area because there was a crucial clue in the wreckage scattered over the Scottish countryside in December 1988. The Lockerbie crime scene was huge. Debris from the crash fell over a vast area across Scotland and into Northern England. The plane disintegrated. The material that was inside the plane, uh, the personal possessions of those on board, fell in two broad strips that went away from the east, from Lockerbie. One to the north, one to the south. 
so the police searches were concentrated in these areas and that's where they found most of the important debris and the debris in particular that linked back to Malta and to Tony Gouch's shop. In the freezing cold of December 1988, and for months into 1989, come rain, come shine, scores of policemen, policewomen, and volunteers were doing exhausting fingertip searches on these bleak hills. Just over there is a low hill called Sufficient Hill. It's to the right of that knoll. On, on Sufficient Hill, on Christmas Eve 1988, the police found a bomb-damaged umbrella. Now that umbrella was linked back to Malta and to Gauchy's shop. It was of a type that was sold in Gauchy's shop. Now this was absolutely critical because Gauchy said one of the very few consistent elements of Gauchy's account was that as the customer who bought the clothes left the shop, it started to rain and the customer bought an umbrella. He picked up the umbrella and he said he would come back shortly. He then walked out the shop with the umbrella, which he opened as it was raining. We're now heading into Slima. I want to try and trace Major Mifsud. He was a meteorologist at the time that the Pan Am plane went down. The Commission have raised some concerns uh, as to whether or not it was actually raining on the day of the purchase of the clothing from Gucci's shop. Gucci claimed it was, and that's why he sold him an umbrella. We're going to speak to this man. He was the man in charge, and he may be able to tell us whether it was raining or not. I found him flat three. Even though he's long retired, Major Mifsud still keeps all his old meteorological data from 24 years ago. Major Mifsud, how certain can you be about the rainfall on Malta? Say between 5 pm and 7 pm on the night of the 7th of December 1980. Between 5 pm and 7 pm. Well, according to the records that I have here, on the 7th of December, yes. no rain fell, fell at Luha. How far from Luha is Slima? Roughly about five kilometres as the crow flies. And if you were asked now about the rainfall on Malta on the 7th of December 1988, what could you say? Well, at that particular time in the evening, right on the 7th, I could vouch say I could uh, I'm 100 percent certain that it did not rain at Loa because of the records that I have. Slima being only about uh, four or five kilometers away from Loa, I would uh, actually say again say that uh, the percentage would be uh, of no rain would be very high. Yes. say about 90 percent, even as regards the uh, cloud pattern at that time. I mean, clouds, uh, there was a lot of cirrus, high cloud. Normally, it doesn't rain from that cloud. So the probability of rain uh, at Slima is, is very low, let's say that. The SCCRC report concluded that if it did not rain on the one day that Al Magrahi is known to have been in Malta, the safety of his conviction is in serious doubt. The SCCRC report contains more evidence that undermines the Crown case that Gauchi sold the clothes on December the 7th. This statement was one of the documents the prosecution failed to pass to the defence. Now, in this statement, he said that he thought the date upon which the purchase took place was November the 29th. Now, he could remember why. It was because he'd had a row with his girlfriend that day. So this information about the row with the girlfriend was hugely significant. It destroys the case against Mr. McGrahy because the only date upon which he could have bought the clothes was December the 7th. 
the SCCRC report focused on evidence that helps fix the exact date on which the clothes were sold in Gauchi's shop. And that depended on the day when the Christmas lights were switched on in Slima. At Christmas time, we put up the decorations about 15 days before Christmas. The decorations were not up when the men bought the clothing. There were no Christmas decorations up, as I've already said. For more than 20 years, the Scottish police have been unable to establish the date on which the lights were switched on. But SCCRC investigators, and now George Thompson, tracked down an important witness. These are the, the Christmas lights. It's practically 5.30 now, the same time I remember turning them on 23 years ago. 23 years ago, Dr. Michael Rifalo was down here on the seafront near the ferry terminal. Yes, it is. He was then the local MP and Malta's Minister for Tourism. When did you switch these ones on? Well, my diary tells me that I switched them on on the 6th of December, 1988. 5.30, just practically to the hour. If I was to tell you that the prosecution case was at were purchased on the 7th, 7th. 7th of December. Yeah. You could say that by that time you'd already performed the I experiment. Could, the, yes, the lights were turned on on the 6th. That's, I have no doubt in my mind. So this is my diary. It's Tuesday, December the 6th. And down here in pencil, there is 5.30 Christmas lights, ferries. The commission in its own investigation um, came to the view that the Christmas lights uh, were um, up by the 6th of December and that as a consequence um, that the purchase date was likely to have been prior to the 6th of December. Tony Kelly was Al Magrahi's solicitor for five years. For him, the evidence about the umbrella, Gauchi's row with his girlfriend and the Christmas lights that weren't turned on all add up to one thing. The 7th of December, the choice of the date of purchase is crucial. It's really crucial to the whole case, I think. And as soon as you remove that, or you place doubt upon that being the date of purchase, you basically remove um, really the, the, the whole underpinning of the Crown case against Mr McGrath. In its report, the SCCRC found not only that there were six grounds on which Al Magrahi should be allowed to appeal against his sentence, but that evidence that might have favoured him was withheld from his defence lawyers. The six grounds came under three general headings, and those were unreasonable verdict, uh, the discovery of fresh evidence, and the non-disclosure of evidence at the time of the trial to the defence. And there was other additional evidence which fell in also to the category of non-disclosure. They gave us papers, photocopy of papers, most of them black and white, black and white, black and white. How could they go ahead with black and white? When McGrahy talks about black and white, black and white, this is what he means. We got disclosure of some documents, but huge swathes of it are redacted. The British authorities also withheld secret intelligence cables from the defence. The Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission came across two classified documents that had been provided to our intelligence services by a foreign intelligence service. They said that the failure to disclose those documents also potentially created a miscarriage of justice. Unfortunately, they were not allowed to reveal the contents of those documents. Once Mr. Tony, go, uh, Tony, Tony Kelly, yes. my solicitor asked me, boss, can you make any comment about that documentation? I told him, clearly, Tony, it's black and white. For his legal team, nothing is more disturbing than the process that led Tony Gauci to identify Al Magrahi as the man who visited his shop. There were a lot of question marks over the quality of that evidence. One of the 
concerns was that there were three identification procedures, all of which had problems attached to them. In particular, at the identification parade, when Mr. Gauchy attended that and uh, identified the appellant as resembling the purchaser. Ian McKee has long experience of Scottish police procedures. He served for 30 years in the force, rising to the rank of superintendent. I could not tell you how worried I am about the identification evidence in the Lockerbie case. It's central to the success of the prosecution and it's totally fraud from beginning to end. The evidence that convicted Al Magrahi goes back to Mary's house and Tony Gauchi's description of the mysterious Libyan who came shopping one evening. As we've already seen, Gauchi is broad shouldered, six feet tall, dark skinned, 50 year old man, bears little resemblance to the five foot seven inch, light skinned, 36 year old Al Magrahi. In the course of the next few months, Gauchi was asked to view photographs of suspects a number of times. Going back to witnesses time and time again should not be allowed, and the court should not allow it, the prosecution should not allow it, because what happens is that pressure's put on them, pressure to identify someone, pressure to, if you like, solve a crime. And eventually, I think most witnesses would, will crumble under that. The final stage of the process took place in the heavily guarded Camp Zeist in Holland. Here, an entire courthouse was built for the trial of the Lockerbie bomber. Today, it stands empty and abandoned. On April the 13th, 1999, police organized an identity parade. This program has obtained unique police video of the event. A number of mostly Middle Eastern men, more or less Al Magrahi's height and build, joined the lineup. All wore identical tracksuits. Scottish police detectives were there to make sure everything went according to plan. Finally, Al Magrahi was brought in. He was allowed to choose his place in the line. At last, everyone was ready. And then, after 10 years, Tony Gauchi picked out Al Magrahi. but the process was seriously tainted. The commission discovered that Mr. Gauchi had seen an article in a magazine which had contained a photograph of Mr. McGrahy and the article related to the bombing. And that was additional evidence, firstly, which the commission discovered, but was also evidence which uh, had not been disclosed to the defence at the time of the trial. He had a copy of this magazine called Focus, which had uh, a small photograph of Mr. McGrahy in it under the caption, who planted the bomb. But what the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission established was that he'd had this magazine for many months before Lockerbie. And what was really important about that was this was not disclosed to the defence. And the defence had no idea that when he went to the parade, he had this uh, picture with Bomber uh, written underneath it. So the uh, commission considered that the failure to disclose that evidence uh, may have caused a miscarriage of justice. After eight years in Scottish prisons trying to prove his innocence, Abdel Basit Al Magrahi was diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer. Given three months to live, he was released on compassionate grounds and went home to die in Libya. Those present say there were tears in his eyes when he had to give up the fight to clear his name. I think whenever he abandoned his appeal, he did so with a heavy heart. I think it was a matter of great regret for him, uh, and I don't think it can in any way be perceived as even a tacit admission of guilt. Now on his deathbed in Tripoli, Al Magrahi's reaction to the SCCRC report is mixed. The commission did it in some way, in some way, some way and somehow they did a good, very, very good job, but. Some area, they ignored some area. 
they try, I mean, some area they're supposed to, to go and to, to, to make more, more investigation. They have to explore every area, but they ignore that area, so I don't know why. I don't know, I, it's very strange. The SCCRC report is a real mixed bag. The work that they did on Tony Gauchi was excellent and devastating. However, there were huge areas that were left untouched. This whole area from Lockerbie and for many, many miles was peppered with debris after the crash. And then among that, the police found a piece of shirt. And some while later, within that shirt, a forensic expert picked out a very small fragment of circuit board. And that became the single most important piece of evidence in the case. That was the golden thread that tied in Libya and some would say also tied in McGrahi. The grey shirt found at the crash site had been blown into shreds by the force of the explosion. Significantly, the bomb had blasted a tiny fragment of circuit board into the shirt collar. This had been part of the bomb's timer. The evidence found on the edge of this forest in Scotland was to have international ramifications. According to CIA and FBI experts, the fragment was a perfect match for these circuit boards. And these circuit boards were used by a small Swiss company called Mebo to make timers like this. Timers have many uses, but they can be used to detonate bombs. The police established that Mebo supplied 20 of these specially made timers to Libya's intelligence service. Libya's leader, the late Colonel Gaddafi, was well known for his support for terrorists of every kind. And Abdel Basset al-Magrahi was a government employee with links to Libyan intelligence. The evidence may have been circumstantial, but it was highly persuasive. Hello, it's George Thompson here. In 2011, Al Jazeera followed George Thompson to Malta to find out more. It is the fragment of timer found in the collar of the grey shirt that linked Al-Magrahi to the bomb. Because Al-Magrahi is supposed to have bought the grey slalom shirt from Tony Gauchi's shop. Or did he? In his first statement to the police, Tony Gauchi lists the clothes he says he sold to the mysterious customer in Mary's house. Two pairs of trousers, three pairs of pyjamas, one umbrella, one baby grow and one cardigan. Now, there's a problem there, because not included in that list of clothing that he claims to have sold is a grey slalom shirt. In fact, Gauchi's first police statement makes no mention of any shirt, grey or otherwise. In January 1990, Gauchi was questioned again about the shirt. He's shown this fragment here, if I can show you that. But then he says a very interesting thing. He says, that time when the man came, I am sure I did That time when the man came, I am sure I did not sell him a shirt. And he repeats that later on. He reinforces it. He says, that man didn't buy any shirts for sure. That man didn't buy any shirts for sure. On the 10th of September, 1990, Tony Gauchi made another statement. By now, something had jogged Tony Gauchi's memory. And listen to what he says here. 
About three weeks ago, I was cleaning boxes out in the shop and I now remember that the man who bought the clothing also bought a beige slalom shirt and a blue and white striped shirt. But the word beige has been crossed out in the original handwritten police statement. A typescript also shows that the word beige has disappeared from the text fed into the police computer. But this is contradicted by the Maltese police statement, which keeps the word beige. The shirt, of course, was supposed to be a grey man shirt. Of course, if the shirt was beige and not grey, and Al Magrahi bought no shirts from Tony Gauci, the chain of evidence linking him to the fragment of timer and the bomb in the suitcase is broken. You know, at the risk of boring you, you can't describe just how important that is. It's crucial to the case. It breaks the chain completely. But as we have discovered, only days before Al Magrahi flew home, even more significant evidence that could have cleared his name reached the offices of solicitor Tony Kelly and his investigator John Ashton. It came in boxes of documents from explosive experts working for Britain's Ministry of Defence. Buried in those files were two documents that have never been disclosed before. These notes were written by a Ministry of Defence scientist called Alan Faraday. He has been analysing the fragment of circuit board found at the crash site. His notes describe the plating on the circuit board fragment as pure tin. But when Faraday examines a sample of undamaged circuit board of the type sent to Libya, he comes up with a different result. Here he describes the plating not as pure tin, but as an alloy of 70% tin and 30% lead. To link Libya and Al Magrahi to the bomb, the fragment of circuit board and the board itself should have been identical. During the trial, Faraday described them as similar in all respects. The, the crown evidence um, and the undisputed evidence at trial was that the coating on the circuit boards was of pure tin. Asked to explain the discrepancy, the Ministry of Defence responded that while the coatings may have been modified, identification rests on the tracking patterns on the circuit boards. To get to the truth, Al Magrahi's legal team sought a professional opinion from Jess Corley, a widely respected scientist who is also registered as an expert witness by British courts. I'm, an, I'm a metallurgist by training. We're going to the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre of Sheffield University with respect to uh, some work I did on fragments and samples that relate to the Lockerbie bombing. The Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre is a place of cutting-edge science and technology sponsored by world-class companies like Rolls-Royce and the firm that built Pan Am 103, Boeing. The police were aware of the discrepancy between the fragment of the bomb's timer and the sample of undamaged circuit boards. They consulted two academic scientists who tentatively advanced a theory that the lead might have been vaporized during the explosion. Using an electron microscope and a furnace, Corley conducted experiments to see if the intense heat of the exploding bomb could have vaporized the lead, leaving only tin. Corley's disturbing findings are broadcast here for the first time. I exposed the cir circuit boards uh, to very high temperatures, around 1,000 degrees C or so, for a few seconds. A great deal more energy in that, ex in that experiment itself than would have been caused by an explosion. Okay, now, when I came to analyse those samples, 
there was no loss of any alloy content, no loss of lead. The hypothesis that uh, because of the explosion that lead had evaporated from this alloy, uh, it was, was, was not substantiated by the experiments that I did. From the prosecution point of view, Dr. Coley's final conclusion could not have been more devastating. This led me to conclude that the cir this circuit board, this control sample, was manufactured by um, a different process to the uh, original fragment that I analysed. Dr. Corley's conclusions are incredibly significant because they demonstrate, in effect, that the Lockerbie fragment of circuit board could not have been from one of the circuit boards that were used in the timers that went to Libya. Now, this not only destroys the case against Mr. McGrahi, it also destroys the case against Libya. Well, the significance is that it breaks the chain. What you have is a, a circumstantial case built against Mr. McGrahi, and that removes a crucial strand. It's pretty difficult to see how you could link um, the commission of this offence back to Libya and back to Libyan intelligence services. As this program has shown, the evidence Tony Gauci gave about Abdel Basset al Madrahi during the trial is now wholly discredited. And the forensic evidence that linked a fragment of timer to Libya is also false. If all this is true, then the entire case against the alleged Lockerbie bomber collapses completely. Had his appeal ever taken place, all this evidence would have come to light and Megrahi would have walked from the court as an innocent man. Which begs a question. If Megrahi and Libya were not responsible for the Lockerbie bombing, then who was the guilty party? There, there is a question of whether or not the Christmas lights are switched on, but that's only part of it. Was it raining that day? Was it not raining that day? What size was this man? What height was he? What age was he? All these things Gauchi got wrong, and at the end of the day, he was paid two million American dollars for what? It's a long time since the locals have seen Gauchi in his favorite hangout. On Malta, it's widely believed that, in return for the evidence he gave in court, Gauchi has banked his share of the reward money and moved abroad. I used to come here a lot. This lad here told me off camera that he was, um, he'd gone to Australia, but he won't say anything on camera to me. He may have the money, but he's lost, I think he's lost respect. A year ago, George Thompson went looking for Tony Gauci. There was no sign of the man at his last known address, but an expensive sports car was parked in the drive. Under Scottish law, witnesses cannot be offered reward money, lest it taint their evidence. But the American government had posted a $4 million reward for information leading to an arrest. Next time Thompson drove past, he glimpsed a grey-haired man in a red polo shirt. He certainly looked like Gauchi. On the third drive past, Thompson spotted the same man being driven off in a green car. There's him, in that car. Thompson tailed the car because he wanted Gauchi to confirm or deny credible reports that the US Department of Justice paid him $2 million. But then the green car spotted our camera, and the next stop was a police station. As he climbed the stairs, Thompson got a good look at him. So George, was that him? Definitely, yes. I'm now 200% sure because I've just been questioned by the police and asked why I'm interested in Tony Gauci. Mr. Gauci has not responded to approaches from this program. Scottish police maintain that Gauci showed no interest in any reward money before the trial. But Scotland's Criminal Case Review Commission found police memoranda that cast a new light on that claim. 
There's a police memo from 1991 which states that around the time that uh, Mr. Gauci picked out Mr. McGrahi's photograph, it says that during recent meetings with Tony Gauci, he has expressed an interest in receiving money. It was flawed from top to bottom. It seems as if Gauci was coached in his evidence and he was given money for his evidence. Identification of evidence like that has got no value at all. In Tripoli, it is still Al Magrahi's dying wish to see his name cleared. And he has a message for Tony Gauci. If I have a chance to see him, I'm forgiving him. I'll say, I tell, I tell him dearly that I never ever in my entire life been in his, in his shop. I never ever buy any clothing from him. And I tell him that he, he dealt with me very wrongly. While Abdel Basset al Megrahi was fighting his losing battle against cancer, Thompson was in Malta only minutes away by air. George Thompson continues to follow new leads but he doubts that he and al Magrahi will ever meet again. He used to say a nice thing when he started to realise that we may be uncovering evidence that can get him out. Uh, he used to tell me that one day him and I would swim in the blue Mediterranean Sea together. I don't think that'll happen now. I'm facing my God very soon. I swear with my God, which is my God and God, his God as well. I swear with him for this. I've never been in his shop because when we met together one before the God, I want him to know that I told him before I die. This is the truth.